welcome back to my channel. This is S.C. Coleman, author, and today we're going to be talking about a interesting subject which has to do with not just enemy occupation, but uh, foreign forces openly operating uh, on U.S. soil and the path that we will take to get there, at least as far as the plans are concerned. Now for the context of this video, there's two specific documents which need to be understood, in some context anyway. These documents, while on the face of them, appear to be the same, are they form the prime example of how you can debunk a fraud by putting it up next to the genuine article. The genuine article here is a document that was declassified from secret uh, um, CI, which is a compartmentalized intelligence, and relative to the USA for five eyes only. Five eyes, if you're not familiar, are the five apparent allies of the United States being Australia, England, um, Australia and England. Uh, I don't remember which the other ones were. Anyway, they're sort of, if you think about countries as, as having an inner circle, they're pretty much this inner circle of, um, of this uh, organization, the, the uh, intelligence community, if you will. Now, the five eyes, uh, also, you have five points on a star, like the Pentagon also has five points on it. So that's, I think, an interesting anecdote there. But either way, the genuine article is DOD Manual S5240.01A, and it looks like this. It is a procedural document operating under Executive Order 12. 333. This is very familiar. This particular object right here, this particular manual, if you will, is very familiar to anyone who has experience in the past uh, decade, anyway, and before, in the intelligence community, any sort of collection based activities. This is essentially the uh, manual you don't break. That's because it's guessed into very murky waters as far as something called a FISA warrant is concerned, which has to do with the U.S. Constitution. Supposed it's supreme law of the land, of which the current versions that we have online have been revised and changed and all that, what, all that nonsense. But either way, when you join the military, you swear an allegiance to the Constitution. And most people, I would assume, at least before 2016 in some cases uh, were in these groups uh, out of uh, if, if they did bad things it was definitely under false pretense and in the actual uh, entities within a lot of these units were relegated to small groups of people as far as trees and things like that go usually in the higher levels and things like that and I expect that the FISA warrants were actually to protect the uh, criminal activities in the United States that were going on from the eyes of those who were involved in the intelligence community. Now, the declassification of this document and current consequences of that also present a perfect example of what will happen when you declassify something that's confidential like this, a governmental operating manual. It does not, it comes from out of, clearly, when you read this thing, which is 44 pages, table of contents and all that, it comes from the perspective of doing your job, of being professional, of establishing a, a procedure for how you're supposed to go around just, you can't willy-nilly just tap in on somebody's phone. You need a warrant for that. And that's what the FISA warrant is. Uh, you can't just go around collecting on other people either you have to follow this manual that's how it was done anyway 
Obviously, when you publish something that's a confidential operational manual, it can be replicated. That's where you get this. This document has uh, started, anyway, to pick up steam, and I assume will gain more traction as time goes on. This right here is fraud, but it's not just fraud. This document is an act of war. When somebody takes your operational documents, copies it, and then publishes something under your name, they're not only stealing your identity, but this particular document itself, of which this document right here has certain elements that you can see, such as these classification markings. We are creatures of habit. You can easily identify the real article with, from experience and habit, right? This is a painstaking process of having to put the classification markings beside every single paragraph, okay? It's a lot of work to make. This is very tedious work. It's bureaucratic stuff. It's really boring. And in some cases, it is, it, it's difficult to follow. But somebody who's familiar with that experience can look at something like this and identify it as a fraud. However, this document goes further. This document, the big thing here, right? Okay, with this first document, something we should know here is that this is specific, specific to the intelligence community and collection by the intelligence community of information. It has nothing to do with anything else other than intelligence collection. And this document specifically is referencing Dernza, the director of the National Security Agency, as the head, right? Dernza, as far historically, has been the head of at least post 9-11 intelligence community activities. Of course, you know, World War II, we had the uh, special uh, service office or whatever that was called, the uh, SLS or whatever. I don't remember uh, entirely what, which what it was. But either way, that document is referencing that. On the other hand, this document gets into other areas, non-intelligence community related, and it also allows for things that don't apply to the intelligence community to be carried out. The first of those in this document, the first of those in this document, DOD Directive 5240.01, which by the way, like I said before, is fraud, not real. The first element that they include in this is something called DOD Law Enforcement. That's not intelligence, community stuff. That is as far as we've been taught, a separate component. Now, in addition, this document right here, as we can look inside, has no classification filings next to each paragraph. It Not only that, but it has none of the elements, the patterns that you would find in the first document, the genuine article. This thing was written, as it appears, at a university not in the military, which of course makes you wonder exactly what purpose the universities are for, which I've done many videos on them. They are enemy operations designed for foreign occupation and in opposition to the people that live here and uh, in the, on the globe. They are uh, ex essentially us or them kind of idea, right? And that is the exact tone this document takes. The tone this document takes is how to be a competent intelligence professional. The tone that this document takes is we are going to do what we want because we say so. If you disagree with us, we will use force. There's two different things, two different concepts at work here. One is a professional. The other is tyrannical. We will look at those two documents a little bit more in depth later. But right now, we need to get into this idea of first, why that document, the fraudulent document was published, what the overall operational uh, objective is, and then how they're going to take this 
to the stage of overt foreign occupation, such as the uh, idea of the whole Holy Roman Empire in Europe occupying Europe based under the auspices of the Vatican, or say even just the idea of the Sultanate of Spain occupying the uh, east coast of Africa. That sort of overt foreign occupation, and if you don't do what they say, then they've got big guns pointed at you. That's the idea. That is, uh, as far as I've documented before, what happened, what the situation was in East Africa in the 1800s. The Sultanate from Spain, who of uh, Cordoba, was the presiding um, uh, occupying government, essentially, for the uh, southern coast of Saudi Arabia, which is like Oman and Yemen right now. And they were occupying the east coast of Africa, essentially with large guns and under the assistance of the British Empire. Which is interesting, because you will never find that in, you won't find that in modern history books, that's for sure. But if you read a old uh, Portuguese account from the 18, from uh, I believe it was 1889, uh, that he describes that situation essentially. Now this current situation is going to come down to an attack on Austin, the city in Texas, and this is following a logical pattern throughout history by essentially the same elements who engage in warfare with a different perspective than professional warfighters might have or regular people in general. The focus here is on commercial activity. So your enemy is not an entrenched opponent. It is not where your enemy has stockpiled weapons or people or any of that stuff. That's not how they look at this. They look at this as where is the commercial point, right? Everything is all based around control of commerce and things like that. So in the 17th century, off the coast of the North African Republic, what we now call um, completely derisively and with obviously a singular narrative, the Barbary Coast. The Barbarian Coast would be another way to say it, but essentially the North African Pirate Republics. See, every way that we have of looking at the North African coast in the 17th century is always going to be from that particularly, um, that particular perspective that they were evil and they were thieves and they took what was not rightfully theirs. Well, they particularly did not have a problem with the people of Europe, but rather with the crown and the, uh, the republics were practically independent of the Ottoman Empire and only nominally, meaning in name only, controlled by the Ottoman Empire at the time. Which, if, of course, you Google that stuff, you're going to get the complete crap narrative that they were under the jurisdiction of the Ottoman Empire and so on and so forth. And so an intervention by the crown of Europe was a lawful action. Now, the reality of it is that the North African coast challenged the commercial and economic supremacy of specifically the French control over the Levantine trade in the 17th century, as documented in this book, The Travels and Missions of the Chevalier d'Arvu, of which I have a first edition, uh, Levantine Adventure by Warren H. Lewis, uh, 1653 to 1697, is, um, and this, was, uh, this is the first American edition from 1963. In this document, he talks about the attack on Algiers, in which Algiers was essentially speaking the economic capital of that coast, the primary target of their wrath, as it were, and they completely leveled the city. They uh, used these flat-bottom boats, which couldn't travel over regular seas or for long distance and needed an escort, uh, which were equipped with mortars. Now, when the mortar fires, the flat bottom of the boat and the wideness of it displaces the, the um, what essentially we might call recoil of the mortar, and they would rain mortars down on Algiers, and they completely decimated and leveled the city completely. And it did not matter. See, they said that there was a Tuscan there who 
went back to the city and rallied support, and so they decided to decimate the city. In practicality, of course, this is coming from a French perspective, right? In practicality, when you look at other elements in history, it doesn't matter if the city surrenders or not. It doesn't matter what the people do. If they ha they will bring superior, they will bring all their force against the single economic center and obliterate it. That is their strategy. And this is, ex I expect, what's planned for Austin. Now, Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, at least is what we might call Atlanta, Georgia today, but who knows how real any of that stuff is. Either way, Atlanta is reported to have been completely and utterly destroyed during the Civil War to cripple the South identified as an economic center that follows the same pattern next you have the fire bombing of tokyo which is less well known than hiroshima and nagasaki i do not personally believe that hiroshima and nagasaki happened but i can't personally confirm that and until i can personally confirm that not just from a clearly fabricated narrative i won't believe it happened however the fire bombings of tokyo that makes sense as far as this pattern goes in um in practice. So Tokyo would have been identified as the economic center of the Meiji era dynasty, pre-war Japan, right? Before Pearl Harbor. And they would have targeted that specifically to decimate the economy. That's what they're going after, commercial interests. The wealthiest center in which uh, commerce conver converges and in some cases I believe it's set up that way too they have spies and agents who attempt to navigate commerce to one central point that can then be targeted for destruction Baghdad it was the prime economic center of the Middle East and, and well known in the 70s to 90s and so on and so forth and when the Iraq war started their first target was the complete obliteration of that city Austin, in the United States, logically speaking, will be the next because it appears that Austin is being seen as the economic commercial capital of the United States in which all the businesses are going, coming out of California, coming out of New York, leaving all these places, and they're all coalescing in Austin. That appears to be a coordinated strategy so that they can then obliterate the city of Austin and cripple the economy. So this is, of course... A tactic that is rinse and repeat it has been done before and it will be done again if they have any say in it that is this is where we get into the concept of the DOD law enforcement not military mind you the Department of Defense is not military it is a civilian agency or office which is presented as overseeing military operations not military so the DOD law enforcement is an entire entity in itself as far as what they're attempting to do in order to give cover for UN intervention occupation United Nations now the reason why I would say United Nations specifically is because this fraudulent document right here written up in a university references an undersecretary of defense that is something we have never had in the united states as far as my experience goes we've always in the intelligence community taken directives from dernza director of national security the national security agency not an undersecretary of defense it's, it's i've never heard of that title before that's something the united nations has now, one of the things that they'll do is they'll set up checkpoints, possibly following the false narrative of a crime wave in which they, you already see it happening with all the false flags where they just report it out in all of their different propaganda mechanisms as news and whatnot, these events. So they're fabricating a crime wave. But in some sense, there is a practical measure to this, which is the chaos from the drug trade, the narcotics trafficking. I'm sure a lot of people see it in their neighborhoods. I certainly do. There's an influx of drug activities, obviously under the sanction of the so-called officialdom, the law, fake law enforcement and the, um, the municipal centers and all that stuff, right? There's clearly a lot more out-of-town activity going on related to the drug trade. 
And this is all to set up the pretext in people's minds so that they go along with this new directive of a DOD law enforcement and specifically roadblocks and checkpoints looking for narcotics uh, and guns, right? They're, the biggest focus they're going to have is any enemy outfit is to take away defensive capabilities of the people. As it says in the Constitution, the security of the free state be, or um, the it's something like an interest of the security of the free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Naturally, that means that if there are infringements on the right to keep and bear arms, then you don't have a free state. And they're going to attempt to completely take away arms. So the way that they usually do this, as we all know, is they make up excuses for it. They say, oh, you can't have firearms at sporting events because people try to mass shooters, right? They try to kill people, okay? That's how they start it. And then anybody going around, they specifically target with uh, a vindictive operational strategy of not carrying weapons at all, period, wherever you go. They get very nasty about it. And so these checkpoints will be probably be staffed by people in military uniforms, but clearly not of military experience, right? Thugs, people that came off the street, people with neck tattoos, face tattoos, all that. Stuff. You'll see people like that, drug drug addicts and drug dealers wearing military uniforms at these roadblock checkpoints, and they will particularly harass and target those who carry weapons, not so much caring about drugs or anything like that. But they'll do it under the guise of, oh, we're going to look for, you know, uh, certain people uh, possible to stop crime, to stop active shooting, you know, so they'll have they'll have the pretext and scenario that they created to begin with to establish this under the cover of removing and fixing the problem they made. And the way to get through these checkpoints will be uh, the issuing of blue envelopes. So the way they always have these, these workups to things, right? They operate under cover. Like any covert operation, you need to cover so that you can get your stuff through without it being sabotaged in the early stage, without being identified by the opponents who will stop you. So they're going to start this blue envelope thing as, uh, well, first of all, we don't have checkpoints in the United States right now. We don't have police, state police, uh, national police. We don't have military checkpoints. We have no checkpoints in the United States at all, except that maybe like bases. Uh, and the most, the closest thing we have are these stupid sobriety checkpoints uh, for um, drunk driving stuff. Right. Of course, again, that that's likely leveraged for other things. But either way, um, the blue envelopes are starting out under the guise of protecting those with autism. So they create obviously mental problems. They create health problems. They create all this stuff. And then they leverage that as cover for doing more damage. Essentially, they are enemies. Right biggest thing there are enemies and so um they reference in these things that we've seen passed in different states uh the fact that these blue envelopes are going to be for those with autism and other sort of mental disorders to be able to more discreetly and with less pain navigate these checkpoints obviously insinuating that there will be checkpoints and on the major highways at all the intersections and mostly centered i expect around big cities and so when they want to completely level and destroy Austin, what they do is they set up checkpoints around all the major highways around Austin, and anybody who tries to get out, they kill. So they ensure that there's complete decimation of that city and everybody's dead. And only a few handful of people, especially their agents who are given these blue envelopes, can actually get out. So very dangerous. Now, the ones who are tangibly doing this, right? You always want to identify who your real enemy is. Like you understand their operation, you understand what they're doing, but you need to know who's actually doing it. Who do you need to go after as the a, a effective operations? What we're talking about is warfare. And there's only really two laws in warfare. One is the use of superior force and the other is effective measures, right? You don't do anything outside. You don't do think you attempt to anyway, not to do anything that will waste your time. You attempt to do things that uh, will effectively either dissuade or damage the operations of the enemy, if not with the ultimate objective of, of course, destroying them. That's true war. That's 
that's real war. That's what we're in now. Now, the enemies that are carrying these things out are what you would term the gray men. The gray men are, the gray man is a term used in covert operations to reference somebody who passes under the radar, who essentially wears a gray suit, who goes uh, just middle of the road, you don't notice them, they go, you know, the fly on the wall kind of idea. There's three main titles of gray men that we see today who are effectively carrying these out, operations out intentionally, which makes them enemy agents, overt enemy agents. You have some people who are ignorant here and there, but individuals with these titles are, are not ignorant because you can tell in their tactics and their strategies and the fact that they want to preserve their cover and the fact that the system is leveraged to protect them, that they are in fact enemies. The first are health directors. Now the health director is the easiest one because we all saw just how tyrannical they were and how much they did not care about what damage they did to anyone, about how much they acted like overt enemy agents. During 2020, the COVID crap, you know, the health directors were the ones going around threatening people, shutting down businesses, causing mayhem, right? So we all understand about health directors. Of course, less people understand entirely about what health directors do and what heinous acts they're actually involved in, being, of course, behind narcot flooding the streets with narcotics in order to cause damage and things like that, poisoning water, poisoning air, all that stuff. Health directors would be behind that. But they're also spies, as according to the cardinal principles of secondary education, in which they're tasked with leveraging children to spy on the communities and to spy on parents, right? And also to leverage those children as hostages. So health directors are particularly... Uh, despicable when it comes to enemy agents. Now, the other two are, are possibly less known today. Some are very familiar with them, but most probably aren't. The first of those is the Chief Compliance Officer. It's in the name Compliance. That's also another big thing that was around in 2020 and has been this decade, is about complying to unlawful mandates and about how they try to get this, this narrative going of, um, of somebody who will not comply, but they essentially just act like a child, petulant child and go limp and stuff like that. Non-compliance, in their, in their term, is simply somebody who refuses to do the directive and they will make them do that, right? That's non-compliance. And that's the perspective. That's the enemy perspective. But chief compliance officer is the tangible agent who's doing these things, and generally they leverage financial mechanisms. Do what we say or we will cut off your finance, basically. You'll make it so you can't eat anything, we'll close your bank accounts, we'll do all of this stuff. That's how chief compliance officers work. And you generally find them in corporations, but of course, naturally, we have a so-called governmental office of compliance. Something that would have been unthinkable, but has in fact existed for a while. Now, the third element of which many who are involved in real estate specifically would be aware are environmental assessors. From their activities, from their actions, and from every single individual you'll meet who is an environmental assessor, they reek of being foreign agents. Everything they do is designed to act undercover for military operations of warfare to damage the country and the people specifically to target infrastructure and defensible capabilities. You can see it throughout all of their activities that that's what they're doing. And of course they're going to say that's not what they're doing because nobody's going to admit to that because that's when you get shot, right? It's, it's plain and simple. So what you want to do with these people, what the most effective measure would be with them is to gain leverage. So if you kill one of them, they'll just replace that person with another one, right? They have a lot of these little f embedded foreign agents that they can move around and whatnot. So, and then, of course, you're going to get the whole system leveraged against you because they're enemies. So one of the best things you can do is to leverage against any individual, right? So you identify a health director and you get leverage on them. You identify a chief compliance officer, you get leverage on them and you identify environmental assessors, you get leverage on them. So what this will, basically there's uh, four main ways that you can go about this. Um, 
I could call them the four E's or something like that. Or the four evidences, if you will. But it doesn't, that wouldn't exactly be accurate because it's not so important. Sometimes, it, depending on context, it's important the type of evidence. But the main idea here is to get evidence, meaning tangible proof that you can leverage. That's your leverage. Your leverage is evidence, okay? You want to get evidence as leverage. Obviously, you're going to have to frame that evidence correctly. Now, the evidence of treasonous activity and crimes, that can be effectively distributed among the neighbors of the individual that you're leveraging. And here's the main thing, main scenario here. See, a lot of people will think, okay, uh, they think about uh, blackmail, shall we say. Blackmail, uh, as far as uh, what it is um, for the fraudulent banking court system is a definition from the United States Code. And that's generally what they're talking about with blackmail. This is not blackmail. This is not um, pay me something or else, right? No, this is do what I say or I will destroy you. And then when they don't do what you say, because mostly they don't, they laugh in your face, you do what you said you will do. And that means distributing the evidence you have on them, the leverage you're holding among their neighbors so that their neighbors, they'll have to move to a new address for fear of basically being lynched, right? Because if you're talking about treasonous crimes, they have betrayed the people that live next door to them, right? It's the same thing as outing somebody as a member of the KGB uh, in uh, in anti-communist era United States, right? You know, you you distribute the stuff around their neighbors, like, hey, you know, here's evidence. This person's done this stuff. They're actively working against you as enemy agents. You know, it's the same thing as what Barons did uh, in the uh, prior to the War of Independence. There's a guy named Collector Barons who may or may not have existed, and he's reported to have gotten the information that collectors were leveraging individuals in the community to spy on everyone else in the community and reporting those back to the crown collectors in the colonies. And he distributed that stuff among the people in the area. And those individuals that had been snitching on their neighbors had to flee literally for fear of their lives because a lot of them got killed. Some of them got tarred and feathered. Some of them got hanged. Some of them got stoned. And there were mobs that would go and attack their houses and completely destroy them for being enemies. So that's what you're talking about. That is a way, a effective way to use leverage against these people when they laugh at you and they don't take you seriously. As soon as you do that to them, they will respect you as an enemy of them. That is something that you want, or maybe not. It's possible you want them to underestimate you. And in that case, you might sit on it for a little bit and wait for the perfect opportunity to drop that stuff and it will come out of nowhere and they will be complete, completely destroyed. Now the next way that you can leverage and possibly even more effective to be honest because you, it's 50-50. You can't always trust that their neighbors are not in cahoots with them. They, you can't always trust that their neighbors will hold them accountable for the crimes, the activities that they've done against the people that live next door. Because they, they could be the neighbors, oftentimes these people live in the same areas, and so that's not always effective. It entirely depends on the scenario, the situation, the circumstance. A lot of these really nasty individuals, they actually live in environments that protect them. You look at a, large, a lot of the large cities, a lot of these peoples could out, people could out themselves as, for, as inherent enemy agents, and their neighbors would say, yeah, I completely hate this country and I hate the people that live here. I'm in total support of a UN intervention force and the absolute wholesale slaughter of large cities, right? Of, of other, other groups of people. You see that today. That is something that you have to face. So the next thing you want is evidence of compromising activities distributed among their associates. And in some cases, that's even more effective. See, it's just like any criminal outfit. Often, they're more afraid of the people they work for than they are of anything else. Yeah, going to court, going to jail, anything. They're more afraid of their associates. So you see this a lot as a leverage technique is that you find somebody in a criminal organization and you say to that person in the criminal organization, 
I will out you as a snitch, as somebody who is essentially reporting on the activities of their associates, if you don't do what I say. And that person laughs at you. Then you go and tell their associates, or you don't necessarily go and tell them, but you distribute among them the evidence of the compromising activity. It's going to be much easier for those associates to simply take that person out rather than deal with um, an investigation or trying to figure out whether or not it's justified. Sometimes it's just easier to eliminate the problem and be done with it, especially when you're talking about evidence that's dropped under their lap in some official capacity, some way that they won't question it where it's coming from. Now, the third one that is maybe less, less well known is di distribution of information, specifically information that can be used to damage that person among their enemies. So as the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so let's say you get a health director or, or a chief compliance officer or the environmental assessor, right? And it's a man, they're usually their first enemy is going to be an ex-wife. And women can be very vindictive. Now, if it's a woman, then they're probably going to have another woman as an enemy. That's usually how it goes. Obviously, you do have guys who are enemies of each other, you know, rivals and things like that. But uh, in general, when you supply information to an enemy, they are somebody who has put themselves in a camp that's opposed to this other person. They will not sway. They will not be won over, right? They want to destroy that other person in some way, and you provide them the ammunition to do so. Now, of course, the, uh, the fourth one, of which there are four, the fourth one is a little bit more tricky. It requires uh, more forethought. Some of these, in some cases, can be very simple. The fourth one is not. That includes the leveraging of the environment against your target. An example would be if you find a chief, uh, chief compliance officer in a company, you don't want to specifically target that person, especially if you might get caught by their structure, right, by their control structure. So what you want to do is you want to target the associates of their associates, essentially create a overwhelming amount of problems that are happening all around them that they're com the, they and the other individuals in their organization are completely pulled apart, right? That's the idea there. You're trying to make the environment around them hostile by making a bunch of problems that aren't directly connected with them. It would take a lot of effort to directly focus that back and connect it to, oh, this is happening because of this, per this person is specifically being targeted. So if you don't want it to be found out that you're specifically targeting that person, then you target the environment around them. And in some cases, the distribution of evidence to neighbors, uh, associates, and enemies is also an idea of tar uh, leveraging the environment against them. But it, you take it even further when you go after the associates of their associates. Now, the next one is that you want to specifically go after the individuals doing this. Any covert operation requires you to hide behind cover, and most, most of the time they get away with things because they're hiding behind an organization, and the organization takes responsibility for their actions. That's not how warfare works. The warfare is a guy takes a gun and tries to kill you, you kill him. Doesn't matter who's giving them, well, it doesn't matter who's giving them the orders, but you are dealing with the threat there. That's how this is. You address the individual doing it. Somebody comes to your house and somebody signs off papers, the individual did that. You want to meet them as they are an enemy combatant. In some cases, they might be ignorant, and in that sense, you can clarify the situation for them. And that might make them go away because they'll say, oh, I didn't know what to the what extent I was doing this stuff. You can do this with like code enfor this fake code enforcement crap where they were pulling people in off the street or out of the universities, giving them uniforms and a badge and telling them to go harass people in the community and rile up the community to start a fight. And then you tell that person, hey, this is treason what you're doing and this you can be sentenced to death for this. And then they say, oh, I didn't know that. And they go away, right? Not with these individuals. These individuals are absolutely of the mental state. They understand what they're doing, and they will not stop until the entirety of their enemy base, which is the major population, is decimated. 
That is their objective. Very important to clarify that. So you want to go after the individuals, but you definitely want to get the right individuals. Just like going after any commander, right? Um, now, you of course want to frame correctly what you're doing. You don't want to just willy-nilly drop a bunch of stuff that's disconnected. You want to connect the dots for them. So often when you do this stuff, you want to have a report say, this is how they're doing it, you know, what I'm doing right now, basically. And the framing can involve theater in some cases. Um, you, you can also play mind games in some cases with them where if you don't want something to have the impact that's been embedded with it, you can associate it with something else. So the Hiroshima and Nagasaki are very similar to their way that they talk about the Holocaust. And the way that they frame that with sad music and pictures and burned clothes and things like that, right? Well, imagine pictures of the Holocaust associated with polka music. Somebody would come along and think, oh, well, there was a error with editing. Somebody put music that doesn't associate with these pictures together, and that's how you would rationalize it. Now, imagine doing things like that on purpose. It would, it would complete, cause complete and utter disorientation. It would sort of act like a jamming effect. It would completely dissipate the emotional uh, embedding of Holocaust pictures. And you could do that with essentially anything. It's the idea of intentional misassociation, taking two things that cannot be associated together. It doesn't work with things like children music, because nowadays you see it in like, especially new TV shows like Goliath, for instance, they use children's music to make a situation more creepier, like this guy who's got, uh, who's doing child trafficking and pedophilia with that can old Candyman uh, song. It makes stuff creepier, actually. But if you take something that could not in any way possibly be associated with that, like um, like uh, ha having uh, Chopin, right, that, that conductor, his music associated with like a birthday party or something, it just, the, the things don't really mesh, right? They're completely uh, opposite. And you, so you do that stuff intentionally, you will actually disrupt uh, and get attention by doing that, obviously. But another thing that you can do is frame somebody accurately by connecting the dots and, and forming it that way. They, these people are not just rogue operatives. They're not just out there for their own gain. They're actual enemy agents. And you can connect those dots for people and present it in a factual manner and provide the ability for them to do something about it. And of course, other people just, they, they don't know how to handle it. They don't want to deal with it. They're not really war fighters. Usually it does require somebody to have the mindset, the uh, idea to take the fight to the enemy to be able to do something about this stuff. Now, here's where we need to get into like the term terminology is that a lot of people look at this and say, well, that's blackmail. When you coerce somebody to do something under threat of releasing information or something like that, damning uh, bad information on them, people say it's blackmail. That's something that's misconstrued in the propaganda machine on purpose to dissuade people from using leverage against their operatives as far as the enemy occupation goes. Blackmail, as far as the U.S. Code is concerned, however, is specific to receiving funds, some sort of com compensation, for a threat. That is the specific definition of blackmail, and that only applies to uh, the rigged prosecutorial system of the current banking courts. That's it. That's what blackmail is. Blackmail is not a word used in the Constitution. Conspiracy is another one. A conspiracy theory, generally when somebody says conspiracy theory and they want to shorten it, they then focus on the word conspiracy. Well, conspiracy is an actual word used in the U.S. Code. It is a U.S. Code defined word for as far as prosecution and crimes go. Uh, you might be able to do a pro se civil action on this in the phony banking courts, but we don't have any real courts right now, uh, courts of law anyway, other than maybe a military tribunal. But who really knows? Some communities might have formed constitutional courts at this point, but it, it, it wouldn't make it through the propaganda machine. Conspiracy is specifically referenced in Conspiracy 2 
uh, violate constitutional rights, when two or more people conspire to violate uh, rights, and when it involves kidnapping, threat of force, things like that, that person may be sentenced to death. That's how the code words it. So it's very understand what you're actually dealing with and that when somebody leverages an accusation of that's blackmail, that's conspiracy, that's this or whatever, you can directly identify and say, no, it's not. But on the other hand, you can leverage this against them because anybody, as far as U.S. Code is concerned, who has paid for a permit under duress, say like a vehicle license or registration, because if you don't pay your vehicle license or registration, then they're going to take your vehicle, you're going to revoke your driving privilege, and if you do so, then you're going to have a thug stop you with a gun. That is, in fact, blackmail, because they have received the payment, as the U.S. Code is concerned. These municipal, every single municipal council member, everyone who wrote off on these things, so they're all, you know, all engaged in blackmail. Um, conspiracy is, um, cons is as far as U.S. Cost, uh, code goes is uh, important there too but the, then you look at the definitions of the Constitution like the uh, like treason, right? Treason is a primary definition of the U.S. Constitution now the U.S. Constitution works a little bit differently than the U.S. Code that's because the U.S. Code is pretending to be subservient, but also uh, superior to the Constitution. But the U.S. Code is specific to the ba banking courts that we have today. The one with, you know, the judge that sits up there, you rise, all rise, your honor, all that crap, right? It's all banking stuff. It uses codes and policies and procedures and bylaws and other nonsense. The Constitution does not entirely require a jury. As far as the banking court jury goes, which is a group of your peers and all that other nonsense. That's U.S. Code stuff. Constitution's juries are just people that are sworn, and the law enforcement in the Constitution is the militia. Regardless of their stupid revisions and things that counteract other points of the con uh, Constitution, like um, the use of whichever component of the militia that they choose, which is some stupid argument crap that they will use for this nonsense. However... That is uh, the Ninth Amendment. You know, you can't use one section to misconstrue another, such as with the Second Amendment, which defines what militia is, which is all those that can keep and bear arms being necessary for the security of a free state. They don't want us to have a free state. They hate the Constitution, all that nonsense. So it's all basically word games, and you shouldn't play word games with enemy agents unless you're um, fighting over the... Uh, apparent understanding and capabilities of the populace at large, which is what's going on right now. That is the information war. So, uh, treason is not just levying war. It's also providing aid and comfort. And there's a quite a large number of individuals who are providing aid and comfort to these enemies knowledgeably and intentionally. They hate the people that live in this country and in most cases, they hate humanity, you know, the people that want to depopulate and all that stuff. And those individuals are very will provide aid and comfort to enemy agents with the intent of decimating the population. Very evil and wicked people. Um, so, with these two documents... right here they're, they're, they are night and day together right I've already stipulated that I've talked about that stuff uh, what what this DOD directive thing will do this new one right and we know that this new one was fabricated by enemy agents be, uh, in, because the propaganda system which they leverage immediately already had content explaining what it was and misconstruing things on purpose, like the first one is that this provides authorization for the use of U.S. troops on U.S. soil against citizens. Those individuals might be wearing military uniforms, but they are definitely not military. They didn't take an oath of allegiance, and they won't have, they will not have uh, the elements that come with the warfighter ethos and the inculcation into a particular culture.
They won't have any of that stuff. They will be thugs, essentially. They will not be professional military forces in any form. They won't be like mercenary, which are professional military in some cases. Now, this whole thing reads like some crap you would find out of the UN. Very tyrannical. And obviously operating under things like humanitarian assi assistance, disaster response, and recovery, like the crap that FEMA with FEMA in North Carolina or Lahaina or Ohio with a train derailment, all that stuff. Maritime and aeronautical safety of navigation. And it's f interesting how they, they, they parse these things out, what their main objectives are, and what they hold to be of importance. Now, the main thing that this does is that it establishes something called Department of Defense Law Enforcement, which is uh, to adhere to the undersecretary, public law, all that nonsense. Now, Another interesting thing that shows that this was not written by an intelligence individual, anybody with any particular understanding, and came out of like a university type system, is the use of CI. CI, like I mentioned before, stands for compartmentalized intelligence. However, if we look at their list of definitions, uh, which I need, do believe they, they put at the back, naturally, um, they just put as defined in, um, and of course they're defining it in this document, so it's as defined in this document, which then you have to go to a different part of the document to find the reference. Anyway, CI, they say, is counterintelligence. It's compartmentalized intelligence. Stupid. But this thing was written by somebody that you would, that would write the procedural manuals for police and sheriffs and state troopers and things like that it was written with that it's written with that kind of um air to it that kind of perspective this is written by a professional this is not um and it states the particular u.s government agencies so-called that it states are the national security council the office of the director of national intelligence that's what we would say Dernza. This thing mentions Dernza. This does not. Uh, Homeland Security Council, Departments of the Treasury, State Justice, and Homeland Security, the IC, and Congress. Of course, the U.S. Code Congress, which is fake. But either way, um, this references USC and a bunch of other nonsense. But the main thing that I want to highlight for the reference to the fact that not only is this fraudulent, but it was made at universities. Universities are centers of enemy operations. They are the organizations desiring to decimate the population, to destroy our defensive capabilities, to dominate the people, to re re usurp in open foreign occupation the U.S. Constitution and all domestic sovereignty that we have damage domestic tranquility, but also completely obliterate the city of Austin, Texas. Wrote this document in APA-style referencing format. Thank you.